But I do have a couple of uh, complaints about the traditions we got here in the world. You want me to, you want me to gripe for a while? Is that all right with y'all? Why, why do y'all like, y'all like it when somebody gripes around y'all, huh? These aren't real gripes, just observations. Why in the world, though, do we have to wait till Thanksgiving before we get some dressing? That stuff is good, man. Do they not sell cornbread uh, in, in February, huh? Are there no onions available in March? What's the deal with that? How about those little crinkly deals on the green beans? They never break those out till Thanksgiving. If it's a regular meal, you don't find those little crinkly deals. Yams, yams, pecans. Do all the pecan trees suddenly just bear in the month of November? We got these traditions, you know, we, why don't we sing just, uh, why don't we sing, oh, come, let us adore him in Christmas? Don't we adore him every second of every day? God wants to bust you out of the box today, man. He wants to bust us out of the box, man, of all the religion, all the fabrication, of all the imitation, all the action, everything he talked about, about behavior. You've heard me preaching a bunch. We, 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 we see behavior, great. But what's in your heart that's driving that? Where, is the, where have we just limited Jesus to a certain place, you know? So let's just talk about that. But then, but then our heart can be so moved on Sunday morning, but nothing changed. On Sunday afternoon, I'm not even talking about Monday. I'm talking about Sunday afternoon. To where we, where, we, where we embrace this walk and this calling and this opportunity. I got a whole bunch of other grubs about tradition. <laughs> the commercialization of Christmas. You know, about 25% of the American economy, the retail economy is charged just during December. Like, like everybody's just waiting for, for this to happen so we can all buy ourselves stuff so we can get a little bit fatter and happier, right? Well, fatter anyway. I don't know about happier, okay? <laughs> One other announcement I wanted to make and talking about, hey, you know, how we invest our money and stuff. Uh, we, we take care of uh, sometimes 100, sometimes as many as 200 kids that wouldn't have any Christmas through our ministry at Jesus Burger. And it takes about 10 grand, about eight to 10 grand to do that. So if God moves you to help or invest some of your things, your Christmas things to buy some kids some presents and stuff like that, just write your check out, just make a, a separate check or something and just put Shade Tree Kids on there, Shade Tree Kids. Or you can go to the online giving and just put Shade Tree Kids on there. And uh, we can bless these kids and these families that don't have anything. I know that that's how you do it. I love you guys, Treasure. You guys, I, sometimes when I go to speaking to you, it's like, man, these guys are the best. These guys have the heart of Christ. They're sold out unto Christ Jesus. So as I'm speaking to you this morning, I just, I just know that we're partners in this gospel, okay? In Jesus' name. That we're walking through this and working through this together. The, the false god of Santa. You know, how about that tradition? How's that working out for you? I believe that in 2020, we've seen some things about the priorities of our life, haven't we? There's been a shifting about what's important to us. Church is important to you. Here you are. The life-giving power of the Holy Spirit is important to you. So here you are. I'm glad that you're here. There may need to be even a further shifting of our priorities so that just God is elevated, just Jesus is on the throne. Has, has some of yourself come off of the throne this, this year? Have you seen myself and my own kingdom come off, uh, peeled off different layers, things that we needed, entitlements begin to come off of us? Well, praise Jesus for that. We give God glory for that. God, God glory for those moments in 2020. And I, I pray God right now that as he is rebuilding the walls, the remnant is going to rebuild God's walls, God's way in Jesus' name. Instead of just the little seeker church mentality, instead of just the little, the little podcast moment, 
Well, I'm talking about everything Christopher said. I mean embracing the Lord Jesus himself and his presence and then living in that presence moment by moment and ministering as he's in us, ministering so fluidly wherever we are in Jesus' name. It may seem like that's a distant cry and a long way to go, but it's not. Let's just take these steps together today in Jesus' name. Is that okay? Let's just see how God's going to take us down this path. If I was to ask you today, what is the greatest problem that America faces? Some of you might say COVID. It's a problem. 260,000 people have passed away. I believe that most of those people would have passed away one way or the other anyway. But I praise God for every one of them that are in glory right now in Jesus' name. And my heart hurts for those that have had to suffer and go through these things. How about racism? been hurting boy hurting to see uh be be tore apart this way how can we bring healing to it it's a problem the threat of socialism unemployment the craziness of the economy the sexual wickedness that we see all the lbgtq lie and the deception the godlessness overall Jesus isn't allowed in the schools, the decline of the church. All of those things are problems, aren't they? They're challenging things. But if I were to say, what is the devil? How has he attacked America? What anti-Christ spirit has he put in America that is, that is the number one problem, that is, that is the root strategy of the devil for destroying America? It's this. We are becoming a fatherless nation. The dad in America is not the father God wants him to be. You know why the father in the home isn't the father he wants us to be? It's because America has not embraced our father properly. We have not let him be our dad so that we cannot be the fathers that God wants us to be. Now, you may look at your life and say, well, I am that dad. Or you may be like me, having, having started life over, looked at the, at the first part of life and said, I was a bad dad then. I was not that dad. And you may not, you're, you're the mom and you're going through this. You're the, you're the woman going through this thing. And, and you've had a good dad or if you had a bad dad. But I guarantee you, if there is a fatherless part of you growing up, where you had a father failure in your life, it's reflected in you today. Until God takes you completely over and sets you free and then heals you of this. That father deficit in any of us is not an accident. That is how the devil's strategy is for tearing America apart. Tearing the family apart. You see, the first church is the family. They didn't go to the temple in the Old Testament, did they? When all those people in Acts started to come to Jesus, they did it family by family, didn't they? When the family starts getting torn apart, the church gets torn apart. So let's work through this. Can we work through this together today in Jesus' name? And as we do this, there's no, there's no rocks to be chunked over here, okay? You may be wherever you are. It's beautiful that you're here, that God's going to move you to a new place in Jesus' name. So we're here, you know, we always talk about it. We're not just in the problem identifying business or the problem grappling at business. We're in the problem solving business because Jesus, like Christopher said, in him, we can do all things. So we're coming into that place of owning that and that opportunity to live that out in Jesus name. Who's ready to receive today? Are you ready to receive today in Jesus name? Hallelujah. Satan's strategy is to take the dad's away we've come to think of it as normal for families to be broken and divorced families and single moms and occasionally single dads but in the birth of america and in the birth of god's plan it was completely different think about how families were in the old testament we see those families sticking together the nuclear family sticking together we see grandma and grandpa living with the primary nuclear family and then the kids they're all together we see them out there doing what? Farming. We see them out there relying on each other, doing things together. 
You know what? If, I'm, if I had had the integrity, instead of being a selfish man, to raise up my boy and to take him with me when I was working and doing all the things that I should have done instead of just burning off in my own petty selfishness, then you know what? We, we would have been like those guys on the farm, showed him how to cut those rows just right, how deep and how straight to make them. Show them how to put that seed in the ground. See how God works to put that water on those seeds and fertilize it. And then those seeds to begin to come up. And to be able to walk through those kind of thing with your family, with your daughter, with your sons. And see what that would happen. And then, hey, here comes the crop. The whole family is together praying to God that we would get rain so that the crop would come up. Okay? We shut down on Sundays. And we go to church on Sundays. And we honor the Sabbath day. We keep it holy. Do you see how God's plan was the best plan? Then we saw that in America, too, as the country was built through the 1850s, beyond the Civil War, into about 1910. We saw the nuclear family in America do things God's way. But in 1910, here comes the Industrial Revolution. And the devil waved a big old dollar bill in front of us, didn't he? And he said, oh, come to the big city. Build the industries. Start the corporations. Come get some of this money. And so all of a sudden, the family was split. The dad went in there, went in there to try, to try to make the money. Now the dad wasn't present in the home like he was to start with. Start separation of, of the family right there at that point. It just continued, heaped up after World War II, really went, kicked in high gear. Still a great generation right there. Those men were doing their best to, to, to raise those families and to, and to do all the right things and to raise up those kids. But all of a sudden, the devil, he wanted more of our time. 1960, here comes women's liberation. We want to empower women, but not at the, not at the expense of the home, do we? We want to empower men, but not at the expense of the home, Right? See, we work together. That's what the Bible says for us to do and how we're supposed to do it in Jesus' name. The youth revolution of the 60s, you know, when the young men and the teenagers were together in those times out on the farm and all those times, there wasn't a whole separate nation of young people. But here came rock and roll music and it separated everybody. It separated and then we... Then, then in, even in the churches, we started to have that's the youth group over there. And the mom and dad, just like Christopher was saying, took less and less participation in the church in raising up the kids to follow Jesus. Families quit reading the Bible with their kids and teaching them about those kind of things. They just left it up to the Sunday school teacher to begin to do it. In 1980s, the church became the divorce generation. In the 1980s, there were as many divorces in the church as there was in the world. Almost 50% in the 1980s rose up to that place. That's a far cry than what it would have looked like just 50 years before that. All of these things were of the devil. And all of them were designed to break down the family, to crush the family. And to take the father out of the picture. So that the father wouldn't father like he was called to be. Now, no doubt, by this point in the service... You're thinking about your dad, aren't you? You're thinking about what kind of a dad you had. Don't blame your dad, man. If he wasn't that awesome, see what the devil was trying to do to him. See how, uh, you know, the old wise tale of just, you got to do what you do to take care of your family. And we did that economically. Then many men pulled that plow, but we left the spiritual thing to the mama. Or we left the spiritual thing out altogether. Or the dad had to rest on Sunday but sent the kiddos to church, okay? And that became a normalization. But that was never God's plan. So we're going to go all the way back to God's plan. Is that all right with y'all? In Jesus' name. It's the social welfare programs in America promote broken families. They pour money into the, into the, the single parents. And they make, they, they make it more econ, economically disadvantaged for some families to be married unto the Lord Jesus. 
So all of a sudden we have this shifting around of who's the daddy and who's the mama and where are they going to live. 20 million kids today, 25% of America live in fatherless homes. 20 million, 25, one out of uh, three, three, one out of every four kids lives with no daddy in their home. 48% of the single mom homes live beneath the poverty level. God bless these single moms that are doing awesome and fighting for it. And it is not your fault and it's not their fault. And we love them wholly. God wants to put the fathers back in our life. Many fathers haven't earned that place, have they? I didn't earn that place as a young father, as a young, very selfish father. I didn't earn that. I didn't do what the Lord asked me to do. I didn't value my family. 40% in the births of America today, 40% are born to families that are unwed. Unwed moms, 40%. Homes with no dads have higher infant mortality, education problems, socialization problems. The kids are slower to develop and underweight. There's crime, there's suicide. Teenage girls in fatherless homes are three and a half times more likely to end up pregnant. Homes with no dads, 18% of the kids with no dads, the, the teenage girls end up pregnant. Homes with dads, only 4% end up pregnant. Homes with no dads, Joe, are two, the boys are 279% more likely to carry guns. 70% of the people that are incarcerated have no dads, grew up in fatherless homes. We have a great identity crisis, too, when a little girl can't see what a real man's supposed to look like. Now, why is Jezebel rising in America so much? The domination of ungodly women that we see rising to prominent positions of power. It's because there's an Ahab spirit in the men. You see, Ahab is the guy that just passively sits there and says, I'll just, I'm going to take care of my little flock here, make sure I'm okay, but that's somebody else's problem. And when Jezebel rises up, we don't confront Jezebel and we don't say you're wrong in the name of Jesus. Here's what the word of God says, and here's the truth, and here's my family that lives. And we don't confront that. We just burn off and go do something else. Or we confront it in the flesh and we grab about it a little bit, but it does not move us to change our lifestyle. You see, I can talk about what we're going to talk about today, and I can tell, I can see in your faces and kind of hear your hearts today that you're agreeing with me, and I'm praising God for that, but that's not what God wants us to do. This is certainly truth. He wants us to go to a place of responsibility. Everything that Christopher said, he had no idea what I was going to preach about. He preached my whole sermon already. Did a better job than I'm doing. <laughs> said it, said it all in five minutes. Boom. Okay. But now I'm praying that we get it and we carry it to another place in Jesus' name. That we say, that's me. I'm, I can't. I can't gripe about my fatherless state and live from the father that I didn't have or the father failure that I see anymore. I'm called to something new. And I'm talking to the ladies too here. You're going to see how you work into this, into this equation here in a moment. <clears throat> have you abandoned your post? I had abandoned my post. Why do we abandon our post? Why did dads bail out? Well, there's a pretty simple answer. We're selfish. We are selfish. We want to go make money. We want a newer model. We want to uh, not waste time or, or take time to value our kids because we're watching football and doing our own thing. Not to mention the rampant sin part of us just go going crazy and going sideways. We are selfish. And we abandon our post so easy. We don't stick with what we're called to do. There's no backbone in America anymore. So, there's some in this church, though, I guarantee you. I'm looking at a lot of backbone up in here in Jesus' name. And the backbone that you guys got 
We got to spread it to that to the younger men, to the next generation in Jesus' name. We have to father those teenagers that Austin is trying to raise up over there. We got to father the ones that that Christopher's got over there in Jesus' name. And there's a way and there's a vehicle for us to do it in Jesus' name. We're not going to do it in that pew, by, by the way. And, and check this out. I would much rather you go find somebody to father than, than bring me a bunch of money. I would much rather you find somebody to father than go... Uh, Flip, flip more Jesus burgers. Go find somebody to father. That is where there's going to be great eternal fruit in Jesus' name. That's what we have to do. When we engage people, we begin to make disciples. We don't make a disciple just by going to the bread store and bringing the bread, 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 bread around. The bread, bread is awesome. Thank God for Ray and the bread. Praise Jesus for the bread. It's keeping the kids alive so the rest of us can do what we're supposed to do in Jesus' name. Have you abandoned your post? Have you let selfish motives and happiness overcome responsibility? Have you even earned, have I even earned the right to be a father? I want to tell you that I need to start over. So I want to pray right now. How many of you, if you want to, just raise your hand. I'm from a broken home. I'm going to pray. See, I'm not from a broken home. I have no excuse. I'm going to pray right now that all of the curses, you don't have to be from a broken home to have parental curses, by the way, Amen. that all of the curses will be broken off of us right now in Jesus' name. Some of us have gotten so used to our false living from a false identity of the drama in our house or the problems we had with our dad. We use that as an excuse, don't we? And we carry it around as if that's who we are. <clears throat> I'm going to pray that the Lord would just break this off of us. But as he breaks it off, that means I'm ready for the new chapter. I'm ready to walk in the new empowerment in Jesus' name. I'm going to have to release my daddy, release my family that failed me, and come into a new place. Let's pray. Dear God, in Jesus' name, I thank you for these treasures. I thank you for their hearts. And Lord God, we see that many families are broken, not just broken by their relationships, uh, not being in the home, the dad's not being in the home, but broken by, by sin being in the home and dysfunction being in the home and all kind of chaos coming into the home. We may well be together, but just one big old mess. All of those things in Jesus' name, uh, if we continue to allow those things to be our source of life and we live from that and all of the, the, the negative influences of our dad and his words are echoing in and out of our ears every day, then we are not going to give the life that you want us to. Christopher just talked about us stopping and listening and saying, why is this happening? Lord God, I pray right now that we're listening to you. That every man and woman right now is identifying the brokenness in their childhood and saying, am I living from that source? Or am I just trying to, to, to drive the truck around it? It's still this big nasty thing in the middle of my life and I just pretend like it's not there. No. Right now, in Jesus' name, we take authority over all of the dysfunction in our households as children. We're adults now, but if we don't go back to the root of the childhood dysfunction... And break it off right there. We'll never be able to operate in the power you want us to as adults, as dads, as moms in Jesus' name. So right now we break off the dysfunction of our childhood. We break the unholy soul ties with unholy parents that taught us the wrong things. In Jesus' name, we loose those dark soul ties. We say to our hearts, your source is Jesus and we surrender all of our wounded and broken hearts to Jesus right now to be healed. And we thank you, Lord God, for healing the emotional part, the social part, the spiritual part, all of our hearts today in Jesus' name. We break off the lies of the devil. We break off the lies that have come from fathers who weren't operating as children of the living God in the power of the Holy Spirit. We break it off of us right now in Jesus' name. We loose all of the dark things from yesterday in Jesus' name. Now, God has shown me something. He's saying, some of you have heard your dad say you weren't going to make it so many times. And you've believed it and, and you operate in this gloom and this shadow. I break off the gloom and the shadow of the daddy's curse right now in Jesus' name.
By the power of the Holy Spirit, I command you the daddy's clerk, the daddy's curse be broken off of our men and our women today in Jesus' name. Now we ask you, Holy Spirit, to bring truth and life to our hearts today as we receive from heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I've got a friend of mine. His name's Chase Bowers. He, uh, I met him when I was doing a little missionary work in 2003, 2004 overseas. And he was just this young evangelist. He's funny, and we got along real good. Uh, he's kind of a basketball guy. Anyway, uh, I went to prison, and this guy started writing me letters in 2008. I only met him for just a few weeks, you know, on the mission field with me. And he wrote me letters when I was in prison, and I'd write him letters back. And then I got out of prison, and then he started sending me texts. And every Saturday morning for the last 10 years, Austin, he sent me a text. Every Saturday morning, I'm praying for you, Jesus Burger, today. I'm praying that the God release his power through you in Jesus' name. He's sharing different things. Well, over the course of time, God took him from that little country evangelist to, one, to the pastor of one of the largest Bible churches in all of Central Texas in Jesus' name. He's the lead pastor there now. <laughs> Every Saturday morning, he still sends me these texts right down here in East Texas. That's love right there. So I said, hey, Jace, what are you preaching about on, this, on, the, on Christmas coming into there? And he, he told me some things. And I said, man, God's taken me in a different direction. You know, see, here's what we do. We start to celebrate the baby Jesus at Christmas. But we forgot about the daddy where he came from. We forgot about the earthly daddy that God used to bring him here. And I'm going to share that scripture with you. And it's going to light you up. You're going to say, whoa, I never thought about that before. In just a second. But I, I asked him, I said, God's talk, talking to me about talking about fatherlessness uh, right now. And, 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 and he sent me this. He said, uh, well, this is, this is something that I've been meditating on. He just shared this with me. He said, Anthony Bradley, an African-American professor in King's College, he studied mounds of data on fatherlessness. And he read thousands of pages on producing thriving kids. How many of you want to produce from thriving kids? I know I sure do. The basic formula for men was this, wife before children, uh-oh, children before work. Oh, oh my goodness. Hey, we're really having trouble there. Wife before children, children before work, friends before solitude. You need some good old boys in your life, in other words, instead of just burning off in your shop and drinking cold beer by yourself all the time. You understand what I'm saying? God before all of it. All of these things are in Proverbs. Sadly, boys aren't taught Proverbs in America anymore. Sadly, we need cops and prisons and therapists now in America. Chase, I said, Chase, what are you talking about, man? I thought you were uh I thought you were, uh, I thought your dad was a coach and he did. He, he told me his dad was a coach and I'm going to share that with you at the conclusion of this, of this message in Jesus name. So I want to talk to you out of Matthew chapter one, verse 18. I said, okay, if we take our time today, is it all right with y'all? Matthew chapter one, verse 18. Thank you, Jesus. Let us rest in this. We, we often read the Christmas story out of the book of Luke, chapter 2. But Matthew's uh, description is a little bit more thorough in this one area when it comes to dad. See, we've got to start with dad. So we're going to start with dad today. Matthew 18, Matthew 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed, promised, engaged to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found to be with child by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, before I read anything else, just look up here in a second. Now, we know this story, right? But Joseph had no idea this was coming. We know it and we nod, the Holy Spirit's the daddy and all that stuff. Joseph did not know that at this time. This had never happened before in the history of humanity. 
So we got to, I want you to kind of be Joseph and just kind of slide in here like that right now and just see this whole, he's a regular dude, solid, okay? Got Mary, sweet, probably maybe she's 13, 14, 15, something like that, maybe 15, something like that. That's how they did it back then, okay? All right. Now, the birth of Jesus was as follows. When Mary and was betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her promised husband, being a just and righteous man and not wanting to expose her publicly to shame, planned to send her away and divorce her quietly. I don't think he wanted to hurt Mary. I think he was hurt. I think by custom, that was what he was required to do at this point in his life. I think he was hurting right there. But after he had considered this, <laughs> do you ever stop to consider things, Myron? Before in life, you didn't consider nothing. Before, you didn't have time to consider. We just lived from our emotions, didn't we? When we live from our emotions, we don't consider anything. We can't hear the Holy Ghost. But he stopped in this moment to consider things. And when he did, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Now, I want to explain something uh, uh, chronologically right now about the Bible. The Holy Spirit was not in the Old Testament consistently. He came and went. He came in the form of angels. So when the angel of the Lord came before him to talk to him, that's just like us hearing the Holy Spirit. Because, Missy, we have the Holy Spirit all the time now. We are, like, like Ricky said, we are not without an angel of the Lord always available to talk to us. And us talk to him. We're at a great advantage over these Old Testament cats right here. Do you understand that? Would you like to hear from the angel of the Lord today? I know that you will and you do every day. And I'm fired up about it in Jesus' name. And Joseph, her promised husband, being just and righteous, verse 20. But after he had considered this, see, if we want to hear from the angel of the Lord and from the Holy Spirit, we got to stop and consider. We can't be running a thousand miles an hour and thinking about our own emotional situation. We have to stop and listen, don't we, Tina? I'm listening to you, Lord, over this. I'm considering it. After he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, Descendant, descendant of David. Uh-oh, descendant of David. Now we're going to talk about David, his great, 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 great grandfather here in just a minute. Joseph, a descendant of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Now, Joseph probably didn't even know who's the Holy Spirit. He may or may not have been familiar with that in, in some reading or some, some testimony or some, te some testament, but, but when the angel said it, Joseph was going, okay. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? <laughs> so when the angel is saying it to us, we're going, okay. I don't understand it, but I believe it because you are big and cool, man. I believe it. The angel of the Lord is, you, is with you. She will give birth to a son and you shall name his, call his name Jesus. Somebody say Jesus. And the Lord of salvation. And he will save his people from his sin. Chapter 2, verse 1. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea in the days of Herod, the king Herod, the Magi from the east came. Where is he that has been born? King of the Jews. We have seen his star in the east and we've come to worship him. Chapter 2, verse 13. Now, when they had gone, they, the Magi just left. Now, when they had gone, the angel of the Lord again appeared to Joseph in a dream. And he said, get up and take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod intends to search for the child in order to destroy him. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother. And while it was still night, he left Egypt and he remained there until the death of Herod. So I want to tell you two things. First of all. What kind of responsibility, somebody say responsibility, did Joseph assume right there whenever, whenever the angel said, you're going to be the daddy of the king of the world, the daddy of Jesus, and you're going to, uh, Mary is, 
you're going to have to trust me that I am his seed, that his, my seed is, in, is now in Jesus and is in Mary, and you're going to have to trust me in this. So Joseph did a huge thing right there by trusting the Lord, didn't he? He couldn't see that. How many of y'all want to see something before you trust something? That's not how the Lord did it. And that's not how the Lord wants us to do it. We got to start trusting before we see it, okay? Okay, if you say this is the son, we've heard this story and seen it uh, and, and heard it so many times and believe it so much, but Joseph didn't have that chance, man. This was just happening, bam, bam, bam. Just like Shane and Chelsea and going through some things that are happening, bam, bam, bam. All of a sudden, they're having to go through it right now by faith. Well, as he walked in that responsibility, he never shucked a, ch- a task. He came right over here and he listened to the Lord again. And he said, okay, this is how I'm going to get this baby safe from the people that want to kill him and chop his head off. I'm going to go this this way. And he continued to be faithful in that thing right there. Don't take that for granted. Don't take these steps of faith for granted because God wants us to walk it out. And you know what for us to do it? We can't isolate ourselves. Joseph got up in the middle of it. He got up in the middle of the business. The devil always wants to isolate. He wants us just to come to church on Sunday. Why do you think we have Austin time and he tells you all of those things every week? Because we need to do things together all week long in Jesus' name to build the kingdom and move the kingdom in Jesus' name. It's not about these blue pews. As a matter of fact, this is just a launching station for what God wants us to do and what you're doing in Jesus' name. And I praise God for you doing it. And Joseph was getting launched right here too. He didn't know where he was going, but I was all right with him. Chapter 2, verse 19 and 20, we'll close with this in part of Matthew. But when Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared again to Joseph. How about that? How many times has the Lord spoke to you this week? Bunch, huh? Spoke to Joseph three times over the course of these two years. He speaks to us all the time, doesn't he? Ain't that cool? When Herod uh, died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, and he said, get up. Take the child and his mom and go to the land of Israel. Those who sought the child's life are dead. Joseph got up and he took the child. This man was obedient. This man had the child and the mama as his priority. Do you understand that? That was his priority of life in Jesus' name. Now, some of us have a, a, we have a family that we had as kiddos, as young people, and then we may have a new family now. I know so many of us have gone through transitions in life. We can't forget the old family. They're not old family. They're still family. And Lord God, show us how to minister to them in Jesus' name. Show them how they would hear that they are loved in Jesus' name. Show me how to do that different because I'm not doing it good, y'all. I'm not doing it good. Show me, Lord Jesus. And also, God says the guy beside you, the woman beside you, the single mom beside you, she needs some help. She needs, to, she needs some sheltering. She needs some covering. She needs some help. And that's what a body, the body of Christ does in Jesus' name. So this is what Joseph was doing right there. He was stepping into that place. And that's what God is asking us to do in Jesus' name. Let's look at, uh, let's look at David now. David, Joseph, Jesus. All of these guys were in the same lineage, the same family. Uh, Psalm 51 verse 5. Psalm 51, verse 5, David is speaking. The key that I want you to understand right here is this. If you read the Psalms and you see the Psalms, you will see that David is lamenting a lot. He's sad a lot, right? He's talking about his enemies a lot. But you know what? A a lot of times when he's talking about his enemies, he's really talking about the enemies that were happened in his own family, in his own childhood. Psalm 51, verse 5. I was brought forth, that means born, in a state of wickedness. In sin, my mother conceived me. And from the beginning, I too was sinful. What the the Amplified is talking about right here, saying that the sin of the mom, the demonic sin, the soul tie that was unholy, got into him. He was conceived in sin. Now, There are different stories. The Bible doesn't name who his mama was. There are different stories about where his mom came from, what she went through. Some say she might have been a prostitute. Others, like the Talmud, which is the Jewish... Uh, the Jewish record, it's, it's, it talks about this mix-up between uh, Jesse, 
David's dad, and Nitzvah, who, is, who was David's mom, according to the Talmud. And there was a mix-up, but Nitzvah really was the mom, and Jesse really was the dad, but, but because of a, a mix-up, they did not acknowledge that. Any way you figure it, here's what happened. David was born in rejection. Do you understand that? Whether it would be by exactly by the blood or by his perception, it was his per family's perception that he was an outcast kid. How many of you can identify with that? Let's go to Psalm 27. I just want to point this out that over and over again, David had to go through this. Here's the beautiful thing about David. He didn't stay there. Psalm 27, 10 through 14. Although my father and my mother have abandoned me. How about that? He was born into sin, chapter 51. Now they've abandoned him, his own mother and father. Yet the Lord has taken me up. He has adopted me, says the Amplified, as his child. The Lord is adopting us. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because my enemies lie in wait. Don't give up on me. Don't give in to the will of the adversary. False witnesses have come against me. They breathe violence. I would have despaired had I not believed. How many of you have been in despair? Well, David gives us the answer. Had he not believed, he would have despaired. That I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for and confidently expect the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for and confidently expect the Lord. So here he is showing us this is rejection. This is where I was literally born. This is what I've come through. Wait for the Lord. Take courage in the Lord. It's going to be all right. We're going to keep walking. I'm not going to despair. I'm going to keep on trucking in this way in Jesus name. Here's the answer. So many times we just stick to looking at the problem instead of looking at the answer and then walking in the power of the answer. Psalm 69, 7 and 8. Because for your sake I have borne reproach. Now, David is speaking with his daddy in heaven now. Because for your sake I have borne reproach. Confusion and dishonor have covered my face. I've been est become estranged from my brother's. An alien to my mother's sons. In his household, that sounds like dysfunction to me. Yeah. I've been estranged from my brothers. I, we're split up now. We're not talking right now. We, we're not even Facebook friends anymore. <laughs> what happens when David gets to the, David decides he's going to kill Goliath and he's going to go, go, go overtake him, right? Then the, all of his brothers came to him, started making fun of him. The rest of the army's cheering him on. His own brothers are making fun of him. You see what David came out of in his life. Samuel 16, 10 through 13. Samuel 16, 10 through 13. Jesse, that's David's dad, he had seven sons passed before Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord hadn't chosen any of these boys. Then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? Jesse replied, well... There's still one left, the youngest. But he's out tending those sheep, Sam. And Samuel said to Jesse, get that boy in here right now. We will not sit down to eat until he comes home. Jesse sent word and brought him home. He had a ruddy complexion and beautiful eyes and a handsome appearance. And the Lord said to Samuel, arise and anoint him, for he is the one. And Samuel took the horn, or horn of oil and anointed David in the presence of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. We see the spirit of the Lord and the anointing of the Lord come upon David right there in that moment. So here we are. This is what I'm trying to tell you. He took a, God took a rejected child, a forgotten child, a messed up child, a rejected child, a child stuck out there with the sheep that they wouldn't even let him come in. A, 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 a one that his daddy was embarrassed about, one that's mama was shamed at the gate. This is he who he took, and here's the one he chose, and he is choosing you, treasure. 
He is choosing you to be the anointed child. And when this anointing of the Holy Ghost came upon David, guess what? He is the only guy in the, in the Old Testament besides Moses that I know of where the Holy Spirit didn't leave him. When this anointing came, it stayed with him. It stayed with him through the battles. It stayed with him in the challenges. It stayed with him when he was sad or when he was happy. It stayed with him and the Holy Ghost is staying on you. The anointing of the Lord God is staying upon you in Jesus' name. So here we are with Joseph, accepting the responsibility of fathering a child that isn't even his. And here we are with David, the rejected boy, coming out of all of that stuff, rising up to be the king of God's people. Do you understand that? How can you look in the mirror and see anything but glory in, in, the, in your face after understanding what God can do and what he is doing in Jesus' name and where he's taking out us out of and the hope that's in coming. He's choosing you in Jesus' name. He believes in you in Jesus' name. I'm not just saying that. We just read about it, didn't we? Malachi chapter 4. The last words of the New Testament say something so awesome right here. The very last words. <laughs> we have 400 years before that thing that I just read in Matthew, when we started in Matthew chapter 1, okay? We have 400 years wait. But let's see what Malachi leaves us with for us to wait for 400 years like Jeopardy. Dum, 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 dum. I don't know what's next, okay? Here's what Malachi says. Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet. By Malachi, I never met Jesus, right? And so when Malachi is getting this word from the Lord about what to write, the closest thing he could say was, Elijah, I'm going to send you the Elijah of the new generation. I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. They all knew about the terrible day of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. Lord God, that's what you've come to tell us today, that we had to have new hearts, that our kids can have your heart and we can have their heart and our heart will be for the kids and the kids' hearts will be for us in Jesus' name. He will turn, Jesus will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. A reconciliation is produced by repentance, by repentance, so that I will not come and strike the land with a curse of destroying, but I will lift this up in Jesus' name. There's a man named Perry, about three years ago, came to Jesus Burger. He was like the rest of us. He'd done been in the TDC, the T Texas Discipleship Program. And, 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 and he, he was part of a church over in Kilgore, a little country church in Kilgore. And they came and they started to serve with us. And he would cook them Jesus burgers. And he was, he, this guy became all about Jesus burger and all about love. But I didn't know how he lived his life as a Sunday school teacher over at that little church. It took him about three or four years before the church would accept him to the place where they trusted him enough to come in and be part of their kids' ministry. But they started calling him Paul Paul Perry. And his job was to wipe off the boards so the teachers could put their lessons on there. And his job was to greet the kids every Sunday. And they would run to him, Chris, because he was their favorite. About a year ago, he passed away. A year and a half ago, he passed away. Went on to glory, man. You talk about kids coming. We had a service at Jesus Burger. Well, you talk about kids coming and crying and sharing their life about how much Paul Paul Perry meant to them in Jesus' name. Here's just this guy in his 60s, single, living by himself, uh, and, and all of a sudden he just, he just started to love like Jesus. He just let that love pour straight through him into all of those little kids. And he began to become a father to the fatherless. He began to raise up a generation in love and to show them what real love was. Remember my friend Chase Bauer that I talked about today? He said this, he sent me a text. I said, I thought your dad was a coach. He said, my dad was a coach, but he left us when I was 12. Uncle John, Lane, you got that picture? Uncle John seamlessly stepped in. He was married to my mom's older sister. He was solid and quiet 
and country as a mud fence. My friend Chase is quite a wordsmith. He was solid and quiet and country as a mud fence. He quit school at the age of 15 to work in the oil field and provide for his family. He was one of seven siblings. He got married at 17. He took a course at the college and began to teach building trade to young people. Chase lived with his uncle John and aunt Carol for a bit. As an adult, I'm not sure Uncle John read a book other than the Bible, but he read it a lot. Every morning I woke up to see him making coffee for my Aunt Carol while he read his Bible and he took notes and he prayed. He taught me how to be generous, how to take care of the vulnerable, and how to speak truth about Jesus in the most gentle of ways. He broke both of his arms on an oil derrick when he was in his 20s. He lost his left eye when he was 31 and he died of leukemia. I guess they should have called him Lucky, Chase said. <laughs> Here's what he said in closing. Joe, why don't you come on? He left a trail of young men behind him that loved Almighty God and knew how to love other people. Let's all stand together. Would they say about you, would you be like Perry, where they just ran to you and embraced you? Would you be like Perry, where they just wanted to get to church so they could see Mr. Perry, Paul Paul Perry? Would, would, at your funeral, would you just have 50 little kiddos that just loved you and cried over you and missed you? Would you be like Uncle John, who left a trail of young men, young people, young women behind you who love Jesus and love people. Would that be your legacy? America will continue to be fatherless unless this congregation right here rise up. If we can't rise up, who's going to rise up? It's time to quit chunking rocks and start to go to work. Let's pray. Lord, in Jesus' name. I